sure how good a job I'm going to do on, on, on presenting threading, but I'll, I'll try. Um, the, um, when I joined uh, Park Place to work on visual works, my um, first major job was to uh, extend the FFI with threading. And the approach I took, given that we had a single threaded VM, was to um, create a thread pool in the VM and arrange that when you wanted to do a threaded callout, what happened was that um, each thread in the thread pool was associated with some shared memory, with a, just a block of memory, and the um, Smalltalk VM's marshaller would marshal objects into that memory. And then uh, each thread in this thread pool was a state machine that was waiting on an object oriented, uh, 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 waiting on a platform semaphore, an OS semaphore, in a quiescent state. And then once you'd marshaled, once you'd located a thread and, and chosen its memory and marshaled arguments into this memory, uh, the Smalltalk thread would, would put it into the callout state and signal that semaphore. And then, you know, this thing would, would uh, progress from its semaphore and say, okay, which state am I in? And it would say, okay, I'm in the callout state. And in the callout state, what do I do? I get my arguments from the shared memory and I make my, my uh, and I go into the state calling and then I make my call. And then um, that thread can either call back or it can return. And so when it, uh, when it returns, it gets the result and puts it in the shared memory and says it's in state returning and requests uh, service from the VM and then waits on the operating system semaphore. And then the VM, when it gets requests for service, needs to go through all of the threads in the thread pool and say for each of them that are in a state where they're returning, I will grab the return result um, and uh, convert it to a Smalltalk object and then locate the Smalltalk process that was blocked waiting for that threaded callout to return and then give it the result and, and, and let it go. And if uh, this thread calls back, then it comes into the callback machinery and it puts itself in state calling back and waits on an operating system semaphore and asks for, asks for service. And the VM would say, ah, oh, okay, so here's a thread and it wants a callback and, uh, and, and, and schedule and so on. And so in that situation, what, you, what you're doing is, is, is maintaining the, the single thread that, that runs the, the VM uh, uh, unchanged, but you have this extremely clunky, slow marshalling, uh, which uh, means that for every uh, threaded call out, there are effectively two weights on an operating system semaphore and, and like four thread switches. So it's incredibly expensive. Um, and uh, a threaded call out is tens of times I didn't think it was a hundred times, but it was tens of times more expensive than a non-threaded callout. And callbacks were hundreds of times more expensive. And I think when I was doing the work um, in 1998, that uh, um, whereas a, a callback might be a, a few uh, hundred microseconds, um, that a threaded callback was at least three milliseconds. So very, very slow, you know, very low rates of, 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 of doing it. Um, so these days, um, the, the VM that um, I'm aware has uh, a, I mean, obviously there are, there are uh, VMs like Java VMs, which have substantial teams behind them that are able to do uh, fully concurrent VMs. Um, I'm not in that position have to find some cheaper way. And another uh, example of a, of a cheaper way is the Python VM. So in the Python VM, um, the VM is multi-threaded, but only one thread can own the VM at any one time. And so what there is, is a sharing protocol. So um, uh, any thread that wants to, to run Python has to wait until it can own the VM from the current thread. And then the way that the, uh, the VM is, is shared amongst the threads is that there's a counter which is run uh, on 
certain events. And when that counter counts down to zero, the VM responds to that by checking whether it should do a thread switch and cause the current thread to give up VM and, and, and give it to another thread. And uh, counting is um, a generic problem that's um, counting on events um, that, that, that doesn't work. So when I was working on the, the VisualWorks VM, when I first arrived at Park Place, one of the, the things I noticed was that uh, if you were running large integer arithmetic, uh, intensive large integer arithmetic, and you tried to interrupt the VM, uh, it could take many seconds before it responded to the interrupt on Windows. Because on Windows, the um, way that the VM decided to uh, poll for events was indeed one of these counters. And the counter was decremented every time you did a, um, a frame building send. So every time you did a send that didn't invoke a primitive, uh, the, the, the JIT's uh, frame building code would decrement a variable. And if that variable went to zero, it would go check for events. So why that doesn't work is that large integer primitives take a long time, plus they're not building a frame. So what happens is when you're doing large integer intensive arithmetic, the frequency at which that counter counts down falls enormously, and there becomes huge latency. Now, when you're running code that isn't invoking long running primitives, the counter is spinning incredibly fast, and you're spending all of your time going and polling for events. So what you really need is a heartbeat, is a regular clock-driven thing. right? And you only check for interrupts when the clock ticks. You don't waste time maintaining some counter, which is either usually running incredibly fast and wasting loads of cycles, or running incredibly slowly when you really need it and giving you terrible latency. So any sharing protocol which is, which is based on, on counting, or any um, uh, periodic uh, attempt to be periodic which is based on, on counting in a VM is a very, very bad idea. And instead, you need to go to this uh, threaded architecture where you have a thread whose job it is to provide a regular heartbeat. Now, you want to keep that thread as simple as possible and, 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 and just have it uh, doing something that uh, causes the VM uh, to realize that a clock tick has, has, has happened as cheaply as possible. Um, so what happens in, in, in COG and what happens in VisualWorks, um, and it's similar to what happens in, in a, a Java VM that I know of, in fact, is that uh, because we organize the, the Smalltalk stack in pages, we have to do a stack check whenever we build a frame, because right? we, we may have got to the end of the page and we may have to move a frame to the to the next page. About uh, every second, uh, remember the model which I implemented in the hardware was uh, basically it's a interrupting the virtual machine whenever there is pending external event available. So it means that there is no uh, dependency on some counter and there is also a minimal need of having the heartbeat because there is no need to, to do some periodic Right, but, the, but the, the, the problem is that you have to be at a point in execution where you can take the interrupt. And so it's, it's you know, in, in jitted code, you can't take an interrupt in an arbitrary, po arbitrary point because you're not at the end of a byte code, right? So you might be in some unsafe situation, right? So the, what's going on here is, is by um, moving, um, responding to interrupts to frame building, you know when you've activated a send that you're at a save point. This is both a point where the JIT can map the machine code PC to a bytecode PC and hence map the frame to a context because context can only have bytecoded PCs in etc. So um, what happens uh, in, the, in, the, in the frame build uh, stack check is that uh, a variable in the VM which tells the VM what the limit of the stack page is compared against the stack pointer. So in the, in, the pro, in, in, in the frame build, after you've pushed all of the, the temporaries and you've built your frame, you grab the current stack limit and compare it against the stack pointer. And if you're beneath it, then you, you call code that will move uh, the, the frame to, a, to another page. So what you do is, is make this do double duty. This is also your interrupt check. So by setting the stack limit to minus one, to the maximum value, 
all stack checks fail, right? Because it's not at the limit of the page, it's at the top of the address space. And so every stack pointer appears to be below the, the top of the address space. So what happens with the, with the stack check code is that the stack check code also checks for, for events. And so what the heartbeat does to cause the VM to break out at the next frame building send is just set the stack pointer high. So you know, it's a, a pretty cheap way of doing, doing the test. Could be, could be, but it's nothing to do with with the, with the use of that heartbeat. It could be to do with with interrupts. But so um, my good friend Dave Simmons, who is um, a Smalltalk VM implementer who's been implementing his own dialects of Smalltalk for a long time, told me of the scheme that he in invented for his VMs for um, for threading, which is based on uh, a heartbeat. And a very, very cheap way of um, giving up control and regaining control of the VM. So the idea uh, is that any thread that wants to run the VM must be given an integer index. And so the first thread is, 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 is thread 1 and, and so on. And if, if some foreign thread that some uh, foreign code created that wants to, 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 to come in and, and, and take control of the VM, uh, that, that needs to be given an, an, an integer. It needs to be given a, a unique ID. And what we're going to do is have one variable in the VM, which is the uh, ID of the owning thread. And um, that uh, when uh, you want to give up the VM so that other threads can, can run, what you do is just zero that, that variable. And then um, uh, when you want to take it back, uh, see whether the variable is still zero. And, and uh, uh, if it's still zero, you can, you can take control. So when do we want to give up control of the VM? The fundamental point when we want to give up the control of the VM to other threads is when we do an FFI call. So when we do an FFI call, we've been, we've been running Smalltalk up until that point. We make up some uh, call on C. At that point, we want to allow other threads to run. But we don't want to go through the effort that we went through in the thread pool model of, of explicitly giving up and starting another thread because it makes uh, FFI calls enormously expensive. And if you're calling some trivial thing like strucopy or you know add one and two, you don't want to go to that overhead. So what, uh, what Dave's scheme is, is the FFI um, just before it's about to make a call out, uh, takes a copy of the value of the word of the of the current VM ID, the word that, that, that is containing the index of the current thread. So the FFI call you know, grabs that integer and it knows that it was thread n and then zeros that uh, variable and then makes its FFI call. And when the, the FFI comes back, what it does is, is, is acquire a lock that controls assignments to this variable. When it holds the lock, tests the variable. If the variable is still zero, it just assigns its value back. And now it continues to own the VM and, and continues. Meanwhile, the heartbeat is the thing that sees whether the VM is unowned. So when the heartbeat beats, if the heart, one thing that heartbeat does is check the uh, VM owner word. And if that is zero, it knows that an FFI call is in progress. And it goes to the thread pool and uh, encourages a thread to start and try and take ownership of the VM. And so in the thread pool, you've got a series of, of, of threads which are waiting on OS semaphores, uh, not running the VM. And um, what they do in their loop is to try and take control of the VM is to, to, to lock the assignment lock on that word. And if the word is zero, set it to their thread ID and then enter the VM and run it. So now you've got this incredibly cheap way of um, giving up control and, and modulating control because it's as simple as take a copy of the variable and put it in, a, in, in local storage and zero that variable 
and then when you come back, do a, a, a acquire the lock on that word and try and assign it if it's still zero, and then continue. And then the other thing that you're doing is deferring all of the um, necessary work you have to do to freeze the state of a thread, because a thread in the VM is not just I'm some C thread doing something. It's what's the current Smalltalk context that you're running? What's my frame pointer? What's my stack pointer? What's my instruction pointer? What's my argument count? I'm in the middle of a of a uh, a primitive, etc. And so what 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 you do is um, since those are in global variables of the interpreter, what, what the current thread is doing, right? when a thread takes control of the VM, when a thread owns the VM and is able to set its variable, at that point, you can save all of that static state for the, the thread that, that, that used to own the VM. So that you're only saving that state, uh, not when you give up the VM, but when the VM is uh, exchanged between, between threads. So this model um, gives you uh, the um, ability to afford to make every FFI call threaded, because the overhead is only uh, a, a few a few instructions and pretty cheap instructions. Yes, I remember. Um, sorry, in VirtualBox, when I was checking uh, the glove. Stuff and how gloves and deal with the database driver and similar. And I remember that um, Alan told me that there were two ways to call uh, to send the query. One which should be threaded, but it was slower. And uh, other way that it was it should be fast, but uh, it could lock the VM. So you can always choose. So it was. Uh, yeah, it's all my fault. Yes, it that's exactly right. That, that's because because I implemented it. Yeah. So um, that's an uh, everybody heard that question. No, that's an excellent question. So why can't we replace Smalltalk processes with with native threads? So um, first of all, the Smalltalk scheduler has well-defined semantics. It's preemptive across priorities and uh, uh, cooperative within priorities, and that's a real-time scheduler. And uh, native threads don't provide those scheduling guarantees. So if you were to run the existing VM and map processes to threads, the thread, uh, the system libraries would break because they are not thread safe and they cannot survive taking uh, uh, thread switches at arbit arbitrary times. Um, and you would lose all control over, over priorities. So the first thing is that the system wouldn't run. The second thing is that a native thread in typical thread applications, uh, in typical thread implementations, has an overhead of the order of a megabyte of stack per thread. So the number of, of threads that you can have is way less than the number of, of processes, because the overhead of a, of a process in Smalltalk is essentially a context and a process object. So it's, it's, it's um, not even hundreds of bytes. It's maybe, a, maybe 100 bytes, 200 bytes. Um, so uh, you can create uh, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of processes in Smalltalk, and you can have maybe hundreds of threads if you're lucky on a on a on a big machine. So that's that's uh, two sets of reasons, um, and I think that those are probably the most important reasons. But there there, there may be others. Um, so the. Um, The thing I would say is that what, what people who implement thread systems in the context of, of Unix servers, etc., tend to do is, is have uh, what's called a two-level scheduler, where um, the, um, the user-level threads that you think you have, that you think are native threads, are actually um, scheduled by a library over some smaller number of, of real uh, threads in the operating system. Um, and so uh, that scheme does apply to something like a, like a VM where uh, you want native threads, you want, you want the ability to have, to have true concurrency, 
but you want to uh, map a lighter weight notion memory in memory lighter weight notion of a, of a process down onto those those threads so that's that's something that that you that i've done here where you know you still have the the, the nice lightweight notion of a small talk process and you still have the the precision of its uh of its um uh, priority management and scheduling but you map those down onto uh native threads uh dynamically so part of part of the the, the thing that this threading system provides is um, the ability to bind a process to a thread. So there's a, there's a, a, an instance variable in process called thread ID, and if that is non-nil, the VM will uh, arrange that when it activates that process, it will give the VM to the thread that has that thread ID. So you can um, you can like have have the best of both worlds where you uh, you have lightweight processes uh, that, are, that are very cheap and are scheduled accurately, but you run them on, on real native threads. And uh, if you want to, to do a binding, you can, you can arrange this to, to, to share the, the VM between threads. The other thing that you should ask is, why can't we have a VM which is uh, truly concurrent and, and, and truly multi-threaded? So let, let's imagine that you know, we, we kept this two-level scheduler so that we don't pay too much uh, in, in memory for a process, but that we, we do try and, and share the VM between uh, real hardware threads um, so that uh, you know, we can use multi-core, we can use uh, tens of cores. And uh, there isn't any reason other than engineering effort. And I did read a lovely paper uh, early last year, which was uh, by some IBM uh, maintenance engineers who were given the task of uh, making production uh, quality work that I think was done with the Jikes uh, Research VM, uh, Java VM, which was around making sure that the inline cache management, specifically extending a pick when a new class case is, is found, was made thread safe. So if you imagine what the engineering effort is in, in taking, you know, COGS inline caching and making that work in multiple threads, it means that as we go through a pick and take a send miss, that all of that has to be thread safe. So some other thread has to, has to be able to, to modify that inline cache while some other thread might be running through it in a completely safe way. And the basic trick in, uh, in their work is uh, patching the send site to be a jump to itself. So with one, one write, you can turn that call into a jump to itself and cause any thread that comes up to execute that send to, to spin loop. Yeah, and it enters a, enters a spin loop. And then everything, everybody who's got past the send right, can then enter some operating system lock to see who, which, which thread is actually going to update that. Right? And then everything downstream of that call to itself gets modified. And so you have to design the pick so that you can do this. right? And then, in an atomic write, you replace that jump to itself by whatever the write instruction is, and now everybody continues. Now, um, I would love to do that work, uh, but I think you know, for the Squeak community, there's not a lot of us who are desperate to use multi-core, and we have other priorities like the FFI. Right? But um, I would, and I would only uh, only tackle that kind of, of work where you know you take the whole VM and make it really concurrent with a team of at least you know three other people. That's a, that's a big engineering effort, and I don't think we can afford it yet. But I'd, I'd, I'd love to have a go at it. It's, it sounds really fun. Okay, so this is, you know, this is, this is a poor man's threading, and, and it, it's, um, you know, it's, it's worked for Python and stuff. So, um, so um, and I will release this, this, this soon. Um, the um, so the scheme has two main um, features. One is this really simple model of um, owning and disowning the VM, 
which abstracts away from this, this detail of, of, of managing the, the, the variables. It means that at, at anywhere in the VM, you can um, uh, give up the VM to another thread. So uh, when, when is the another one is the uh, that you could eventually use multi, uh, multi thread not only with FFI but with other stuff. Oh, well, I'll show you. I'll show you. I mean, it's not eventually; it's now. So, here we've got the um, the, the the heart of the callout mechanism in the threaded FFI. So that, that's exactly what we looked at this morning. And uh, because uh, people at Teleplace wanted control over whether every call was threaded, we actually have to include a flag bit, you know, include a keyword threaded in the, C, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, declaration of the FFI call, which translates down into a bit being set in the, um, in the, in the spec word that the, the VM looks at. So if, uh, if a callout uh, is threaded, then we call disown VM. And so from this point on, uh, if the heartbeat beats, another thread will, will be kicked off and it will take ownership of the VM. It'll try and take... Uh, that's right. From here on, you must not touch the VM state. That's right. Until you get back to here, and you try and own the VM. And so this abstraction uh, 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 takes care of trying to set the VM owner index back, and if not, going into a wait state, mm -hmm. right? So um, that's actually used uh, in a plugin. So um, this is uh, the cross-platform C code for square file write, read into. So that's the innards in the VM of how you read from a file. And um, what happens down here is a flag is, is set. Uh, inside the, 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 the stream descriptor, the object that holds onto the, 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 the file, the C file. And uh, it says, okay, first of all, um, we have to, we, we, we can't be holding onto a movable object while we've, um, uh, the, the file handle is actually, the, 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 this file object is actually in a byte array. So if you, you, know, if you, if you look at standard output, uh, if you look at standard out, um, this file ID is actually one of these uh, structs and what does the struct look like well anyway yeah it looks like this so it's uh, it's a session ID and a, a, an actual C file it should be this um, and then a file size and then some byte flags okay so that is what we have uh, this is uh, the last byte and etc so um, the problem is that that's, that's an object on the heap, and the garbage collector can move that object. So what's going on here is, right now, this hack saying, OK, if, if f is actually in memory and it's, uh, it's in, um, in young space, it's going to get moved by the garbage collector. Uh, and if the uh, the byte array that you're trying to read the results into is in memory and it's and it's and it's uh, uh, and it's young you're going to um, 
you're going to fail. Uh, otherwise, um, when I disown the VM, please stop the global garbage collector running. So old space, don't garbage collect old space. So any objects in, 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 in old space won't be moved. There's a complete hack to deal with the fact that we don't have a pinning garbage collector, that we can't say this particular object must not move for this particular amount of time. Okay. So what, what should be going on here is not this horrible hack. It should be, okay, pin F and pin DST and have the garbage collector not move them until we unpin them. But we haven't got that yet, so that, that's why we need a... a, a and what about putting those bytes into some private memory and then use them in Bazoon and then debugging? Yeah, that, that's, not, that's not the problem. That, that's not the problem. The problem is, is finding that object again. So you're in a thread, you give up control for an arbitrary amount of time, your pointers may be stale. So what you need to do is to record the path, the valid path. To right, for example, yeah, you have to do crap like that, right? So, right, so, um, so this is, uh, you know, I mean, there's lots of different ways to, to deal with this. And so this is a, a, a cool hack by Andreas. Andreas just said, hey, look, if it's young, fail, and then just, just stop the, the global garbage collector from running. But the real solution is a pinning garbage collector where you say pin. So, um, so what happens here is if we're reading from standard in, we will um, uh, break. Uh, sorry, if we're reading from standard in, we will uh, give up control of the, of the VM with this disown uh, VM abstraction. And then we'll do the read. And then before we continue, we will gain the VM back, okay? So let me um, uh, run a little image. So here's a little image and I can uh, interact with this image. So let me open a browser and here's a browser and that's all cool. And I'm using it, blah, 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 blah. But over here in the corner is a prompt. And I can do 3 plus 4, and it prints 7. But I can also do workspace open with contents. Uh, and it failed. So how do we do that? Come on. Huh. How do you do? What's it called? I can remember. Yeah, do you do the exclamation after the... No, 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 no. That's not what it is. It, it's, it, it's, it's workspace, fine class workspace. Okay, let me have a look here. Uh, message names. Initialize with contents. Open with contents. No, resize with contents. Okay. All right, never mind. Let's try this. Um, let's try. Um, What, what message names? There we go. We opened a message names. So that is uh, a little process uh, process browser um, here, which is um, running this piece of code. So this says, uh, uh, um, stood at IO listener new run. And, uh, and there it is uh, running, and it's um, uh, producing uh, prompts and uh, 
I've got a thread that's that's blocking reading from um, reading from standard input, and yet I can still interact with the rest of the of the system. So it's it's real. Now um, I can't find my my demo, but I have a demo where um, uh, I invoke a um, platform dialog through uh, a, a plugin. And the platform dialog takes callbacks uh, to select files to display and callbacks um, for uh, when you've chosen a file or whether you want to abandon the dialog. And that all works with, um, with the callback machinery. And if you saw the, the callback machinery, that when we actually come in to thunk entry to do a callback, the first thing we do is try and own the VM. So callbacks are fully threaded too. And so inside that own VM is, is code like, is this a thread that I know about? Um, and if it's not, then I need to give it a thread ID, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, in that callback machinery is, is complete support for uh, callbacks from arbitrary threads as well. And uh, when we actually return from the, the, the callback, we also um, uh, disown the VM. But the disowning of the VM call is in the um, is in the primitive. It's oh, that's that's um, that's just. Um, in fact, I might have. In fact, that might be. Comp that's probably what's wrong. I'm not disowning the VM when I make a correct return from a uh, callback. I think I've just found out my bug. That's cool. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Let me let me write write. I need to write that down. I need to, um, hang on. Here we go. Okay, um, so uh, the abstraction of, of own disown can be used in a plugin around any operation. So, for example, things like the um, the current uh, hack in sockets to uh, spawn a thread to do a DNS lookup, so that you don't uh, block when you do a DNS block uh, uh, lookup is 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 uh, unnecessary and could be replaced by a, a, a disown own pair around the DNS lookup and stuff. So what's nice about this is, is that it, you, know, you can use it anywhere. You don't just use it in an FFI plugin. You can basically use it anywhere where you don't have to access objects in between. So the next, uh, the next step for this is to, um, apart from releasing it and, and, and making, it, making it work, is a, a new garbage collector. So what, what do we want from a new garbage collector for threading? Just the ability to uh, stop uh, objects from moving. Uh, so when uh, you uh, relinquish the VM, all of the objects in your hand that you want to pass out to see, you're going to pin in some way. And the garbage collector is not going to move those objects. Now, the pin operation might be expensive. It might involve. You know, if the object is in is, is in new space, is in the, the scavenged space that the garbage collector needs to move to, to be fast, that effectively we do a become, right? That we um, that we that we move the object from young space into some uh, less often moved space. Uh, but all of that is 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 is, is quite doable. And then the um, the abstraction uh, becomes. Uh, just grab all of the objects that you want to use and uh, um, uh, pin them. And because they're not moving, it's easy to unpin them afterwards because right, they haven't moved. And outside the effect of this pinning, we have my password disowning the user. 
Yeah, so th that's interesting. I'm not sure that you have a faster become uh, implementation, but um, I've written some notes on the on the design, and I think I've posted them to Squeak. The idea there would be the way that you make this work is um, when you uh, pin an object, uh, you create uh, a copy of the object in the un in in the in the pinnable space in the space that doesn't move frequently, and you change the original object to a forwarding pointer to that object, and then the binding machinery in the, in in the in the message lookup stuff will fail uh, because the what's left behind has a has a has a, an invalid class. Whenever you, whenever you try and send a message to it, you're going to get a message lookup fail. And in the message lookup failure code is explicit tests for these proxies. And then you follow the forwarding pointer and, and retry the, the send. So uh, if you do that, uh, byte objects require no further uh, processing because um, the only way that you can access the innards of a byte object, such as a byte array, right, or a string, is through a primitive, which involves a send. So every access to um, an object which is just byte data is mediated by a send, and so that's, that's perfectly adequate. But um, objects with named instance variables are accessed uh, via fetching an instance variable, right? And so there's direct access. So what you'd probably... Right, so what you probably do is if you try and pin an object that has named instance variables, and you might have good reason for passing those through the FFI, why not? Uh, I mean, you could say that you just can't pass them through the FFI, but if you could, then for those objects, you need to scan just the stack zone. Right, and you scan all of the references on the stack and follow the forwarding pointer just in the stack zone. So that's quite a small amount of space. You know, that's, that's a few... Um, you know, tens of k or 100k, right? And you don't do a full become, right? And you, so you still leave the forwarding pointer behind, but all references in the stack zone are followed. And then what you have to do is, obviously, when, when a, a, a context is brought into uh, the stack, at that point, if that context held a reference to one of these proxies, you have to follow. So the invariant is, in the stack zone, there are no uh, references on stack to proxies. So um, that's one of my requirements for a new garbage collector is that it support pinning in that, in that way. Um, and then the other requirement for the, for the garbage collector is, as we saw yesterday, um, how clumsy the, the, the class fetch is on, um, on the inline cache test you know, with, with immediates uh, and then compact classes and stuff is to have a much more regular object representation where, uh, where there's only one kind of header and fetching the class is, is, is straightforward. And so that's work that I um, want to try and, and start as soon as possible uh, after this conference and try and get something done uh, by, the, by the summer. So um, I haven't really um, gone into much depth because the code is kind of complicated and grody. Oh no, okay, that's what I can talk about. I talked about that before. Before moving, for the pinning, mm -hmm. uh, you see, um, the ability to pin an object, uh, do you think it could be, uh, be available also from other purpose? For example, uh, did you know in assignment for the old pointer that you have in a subgraph, you need to keep an array in memory uh, because she see may move objects around. So when you come back to the old one, you need to know where the object is. So if you swear that you don't move my object, so maybe we can... Yeah, I mean, it would be a generic facility. This is just a general facility where there's a call that you can make of the garbage collector saying pin. Right. Uh, and I can, I can know that the memory address of that object will, will not change for as long as pinning is, a, is, a, is asserted. Right? So there, 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 there are still um, issues like um, it needs to be a test and set. Mm -hmm. right? 
Um, so, uh, you know, what if what if two threads want to pin the same object? How do, how do, how do, how, do, how, do, how does the object ever get unpinned at all? Right. So one thread says, okay, I'm going to pin the object. Right. The other thread comes along and says, oh, I want to pin it. Oh, it's already pinned. Right. And then the first the first guy returns and unpins the object, and this guy couldn't pin it in the first place, but is depending on on it being pinned. So all sorts of you know have to solve that problem. Um, so it's it's kind of is there a is there a pinning count or is there um, uh, um, yeah I mean I, I I haven't worked out what to do about that yet yeah. so. Sorry, that's right. That's right. So yeah, sorry. The the solution is this. The solution is, that's right. Thank you. The solution is throw away the global garbage collector. Don't global garbage collect. Uh, instead, have an incremental garbage collector, which is a a, um, a um, new style two color collector. And what that does is co is collect and maintain free space. But once an object's in old space, it never gets moved. Right. So the only the, um, the only things that, that ever get moved are, are objects in in young space, and then you migrate objects to, to old space and and they and they never move, or there's a subset of old space. Maybe you, you old space is in segments, and if if um, you know if an object gets to an old space segment, it won't be compacted, and the only time it gets compacted is on image load. So on image load, you you swizzle all of the pointers, and and that's exactly what. Uh, the compacting on image load is what VisualWorks does. It doesn't it doesn't pin objects, but it does coalesce uh, all of the objects in the multiple segments into one segment on load. So it's, it's quite straightforward. Yeah. So I think that's that's the right way to do it. And then um, the incremental collector um, is is uh, the only way that you collect old space, and then you get rid of the the issue of of um, of pauses due to the the old garbage collector. So um, to show you a few, I'll show you a few fun things around this. Um, Kind of uh, ashamed of this, but uh, so the way that uh, the the threading system is uh, implemented is that uh, there is a subclass of um, of co-interpreter, which is uh, the multi-threaded co-interpreter, which overrides just those bits that need to be uh, overridden uh, and implements, uh, you know, like. Uh, 30 methods or whatever uh, to add threading and do things like um, add this two level um, scheduling. So uh, transfer from, transfer to, sorry, is the, um, is the basic uh, method in the VM which <coughs> manages process switch. So um, here's the, the, the weight primitive on semaphore. And so, you know, grab, grab the, the count from uh, the, uh, the receiver, the semaphore. And if it's greater than zero, just subtract it and we're done. Otherwise, we can't subtract it. We have to go to sleep. So uh, grab the active process, uh, add the active process to the semaphore, and then transfer to the highest priority thread. Right. So transfer to. Uh, the from argument is only for debugging. It only takes a, 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 an ID so that when you uh, trace uh, process switches, you can make sense of what the VM's done. So basically, it, 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 you know, in the old VM, it used to be called transfer to. So when you, when you transfer uh, to in the multi-threaded VM, um, we uh, have to do uh, one of one of uh, well, basically um, we do this. We say if uh, if the new process 
is um, bound to a particular thread, we better be running on that, on that thread. And so um, thread switch, if necessary, uh, 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 ignore this assert. Uh, fetches the owner index of the of the the process, which is going to be uh, this the value of the thread ID field, and then um, if that the thread ID is 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 non-zero, and the uh, the current VM owner doesn't equal, um, then uh, we've got to um, do all of the the horrible um, management of of giving up the VM, so. Uh, that's the heart of the two-level scheduler. The heart of the two-level scheduler is, is whenever you make a process switch uh, in, 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 of a small talk process, you check that, the, um, that its thread ID is compatible with the, the current thread. And if it isn't, suspend this thread and wake up the thread that's, that's, that's with it. And then there's a, a thread manager object whose job it is to uh, uh, own all of the, um, the state for each thread. So each thread needs a little bit of state, which is things like what's my argument count and my, um, my C stack pointer and my, my new method, etc. So this is uh, all of the, uh, the state that's necessary to suspend uh, a, a thread and, and, and continue, um, and, and, uh, etc. So, um, like three classes uh, to to add threading to the existing VM. But here's a horrible hack. Uh, the there's a bug with the the VM implementation, which is that um, each. Wait, so why VM? Well, I'll go back. Sorry, here we go. Why is co interpreter supply some co interpreter plugin uh, uh, primitive and now another uh, co interpreter? Okay, so um, let's have a look at co interpreter primitives and see what it implements. I mean, it's basically, um, it has to go somewhere, right? Uh, the 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 structure right now is at the top of the of the tree. First of all, object memory is off to the side, right? So that's been decomposed. At the top is interpreter primitives, and all of the interpreters use the interpreter primitives, right? So, but beneath interpreter primitives, No, because the, the, the hierarchy you can't see because there's too many instance variables. Some of these guys have 100 instance variables. So, you, it, you know. So, okay, underneath interpreter primitives, there's stack interpreter. And underneath that, there's stack interpreter primitives. And then there's the, uh, the simulator. And then underneath uh, stack interpreter primitives is, um, and this goes in there. Under stack interpreter primitives is the, uh, the co-interpreter. Uh, and under that is uh, co-interpreter primitives. And under that, right? And uh, so the problem is that um, the way that it was, it was written is that uh, you hack simulation of all of the bits that you can't that you can't um, execute properly by having a simulator subclass. So if I show you uh, what kind of stuff is in, is in Stack Interpreter sim Simulator, that's stuff like um, uh, how do we store a byte in the memory. Right? And so this is stuff that, that C does for you anyway. C knows, the C compiler knows how to assign a byte. But in the, in the, in the simulator, we actually have to convert a byte right into an access of the of the byte array that that were the bitmap that we used to hold the heat heap in 
So there's this horrible thing that the simulator was written with a whole series of, um, of overrides, um, which is really, really tedious. So um, there's a subclass of, in, of stack interpreter, which does the stack interpreter simulator. And then I had a subclass of co-interpreter to do co-interpreter simulator. So it, it, adding the subclass uh, co-interpreter MT would have implied another subclass, right? And two copies of the simulator with exactly the same code. I already had the copies for, for stack interpreter. And I couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't, I, no, it's madness. So how do we have one subclass? You'll notice that there's only one cog VM simulator. And it inherits from co-interpreter MT, which in inherits from co-interpreter primitive and co-interpreter. What's going on in co-interpreter primitives is that those are versions of the primitives that are cog aware. So things like activating a method is different with the JIT because you want to JIT the block. Right, so you can't use the stack interpreter primitives. So things like perform and, and, and value and, and some process switch stuff, uh, the primitives need a different version. But the core, most of the primitives in interpreter primitives are not overridden. There's just a few choice ones. So um, you know, here, are, here, are, here are all of the primitives that need to be overwritten. So that's uh, the, the, the process switch ones. There are new primitives like throw away all of the, the, the JIT code and stuff. Uh, snapshot is different because you have to throw away all of the JITs and map all of the machine code PCs inside of, of contexts to, to non-machine code, etc. But uh, the hack I want to show you is this uh, having one uh, uh, VM simulator that sits beneath a co-interpreter MT. So uh, So here's Cog VM Simulator, and it does indeed in interpret from co-interpreter MT. But there's um, a thing called uh, a multi-threaded simulation switch. And um, this is all of the methods that are implemented in both co-interpreter and co-interpreter MT. Uh, so for example, What's the C stack range for the current thread? And what it does is use uh, perform in superclass to either perform it in uh, cog uh, in, in, in co-interpreter or in co-interpreter MT. So um, if uh, the cog thread manager instance variable is nil, we're non-threaded and we uh, look up the method in co-interpreter primitives. And if it's non- <laughs> If it's non-nil, we look at in co-interpreter MT, right? So this simulator completely hides all of the methods in co-interpreter MT if, if the thread manager is nil. So then um, when you create one of these guys, you need to make sure that they're up to date and you auto-generate them. So you, you, when you instantiate, you reflect over the selectors that are implemented, and you create methods and delete methods as uh, as required. And so those all of those uh, those wrappers are auto generated. I'm kind of it's like some really dirty girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, all of the code is in this one method. I mean, that's exactly what it does, right? So it 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 it, it both avoids everything that that is implemented in the simulator for good reason, and compares. So it won't. Yeah, yeah. So it 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 only overrides methods that are that are defined above and not defined at this level. Anyway, it's just a it's just a, a fun hack that you can do in small talk. There was no need to subclass in your memory for the multi-threading. 
Yeah, there, uh, that's right. That's right. I didn't need to do anything. So those are those yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I think that's true. Hang on, I could lie. Let's see what's. Yeah, that's right. Uh, there's just uh, co-object memory simulator and its least significant and most significant forms, and and nothing specific on threading. Yeah. yeah. So um, the most important thing is that this actually this actually works, right? Is that you know this little demo is showing that. I can do this in practice now, and I just have to get the code out. And um, yeah. so we have a threaded FFI, and it needs uh, you know it needs uh, use and, and and pounding on. So and. I don't think I've got much more to say about threading. I mean, I could drivel on about uninteresting details, but I don't think I, I should I should have an early afternoon. So, um, if we were going to have a break now, what what should I talk about afterwards? So we're going to do uh, code generation, which we could do. Do the code generation. Yeah. Shall I? Shall I show you? Yeah. 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 We'll start. We'll start now. We'll start now. Yeah. So let let's take a half hour break and then and then come back. Oh. <laughs> 